in this video, another look at the Super NES library. So much to handle, it won't even fit in one book. Hi everyone, John here. Once again we have a book, or actually two books, about the catalog of Super NES games. Previously we looked at Jeffrey Whittinghagen's The Complete SNES, Collector's Book and Ultimate Guide, Definitive Edition. But that's not the only book about the many games you can play on Nintendo's 16-bit platform of the 1990s. There are actually numerous books on this very topic, all independently written by different authors within the span of only a few years, despite it being over two decades, now almost three, since its heyday. Perhaps we are in some kind of era of 16-bit resurgence. I'll likely review them all, but today we'll look at the SNES Omnibus, The Super Nintendo and Its Games, by Brett Weiss, who has written many articles and books about pop culture, including video games. Actually, the SNES Omnibus is comprised of two volumes, each for approximately half of the games, sorted alphabetically. As you can see, these are each quite hefty, with 416 and 464 large pages, and together, that's 880 pages. Yay math. And when you consider the pages are quite large, usually with a lot of text, it can take a while to get through it all. But, as always, I have read every word, as I do for all the books I review. The SNES Omnibus is intended to cover every North American Super NES game. However, it falls just short of it, as it is missing International Superstar Soccer and International Superstar Soccer Deluxe. It also leaves out Super Copa, a South American exclusive game, which can be fair if you really want to stick with just North America. But come on, it's just one game, so why not cover all of the Americas? More amusing is that it is also another soccer game. So, no South American and no European or Japanese exclusives here. If you're wondering why it still has 722 entries, just like the North American section of Jeffrey Whittinghagen's The Complete SNES, it's because despite excluding three soccer games, the SNES Omnibus includes three special games not typically included in collection listings. The competition cartridges for Donkey Kong Country and Star Fox, plus Star Fox 2, which was a cancelled Super NES game that finally saw an official release many years later on the Super NES Classic in 2017, even though it does not exist on an official cartridge playable on an actual SNES. The SNES Omnibus, just like the complete SNES, also chooses to include the only unlicensed game at the time of the original Super NES's lifespan, Super Noah's Ark 3D, but no unlicensed or homebrew games from beyond the original machine's lifespan appear here. As for the looks at each Super NES game, these are more like overviews than reviews. Not restricted to merely being a quick blurb, the main text thoroughly describes the gameplay. Very thoroughly. Stages and playable characters are often fully listed, and there's lots of other gameplay-specific detail. If a game is multi-platform, this is usually mentioned at the end of the main overview portion, and the differences between the Super NES version and the other versions, like the Genesis or Sega CD, are also outlined, which is cool for a Nintendo-specific book to even acknowledge. Sequels, if any, are often also mentioned, with additional paragraphs referred to as memories, notable quotables, and insider insights. This is where we get some judgment or anecdotes from Brad Weiss, a journalist or reviewer from a previously published source, or someone involved with the game, respectively. Every game overview includes at least one of any of these, but several have more than one. Insider insights aren't necessarily positive, such as in the case of Paladin's Quest, or even about playing that particular game, like the anecdote attached to Pack and Time, but sometimes provide long-awaited answers to questions, like what the deal is with the old guy on the infamous box art for Phalanx. Other than the text, Every overview includes multiple images, including a box shot, a cartridge shot showing both the front and the top, a title screenshot, and at least one gameplay screenshot, though almost all have at least two. There are some rare exceptions, like the double pack of Extertainment Mountain Bike Rally and Speed Racer not having the top of the cartridge, but for the most part, these standard shots generally give a brief look at each game. I will certainly nitpick this later, but in principle, these screenshots are a good start. Oftentimes, there are also images of promotional material, such as vintage magazine advertisements. Some are interesting and noteworthy, mostly if they are bizarre or odd, like those for Equinox, Final Fantasy II, Frantic Flea, or Kirby Superstar. But then many of them just share the same artwork as the box and cartridge label. And there sure are a large number where the ad primarily features literally a shot of the box, such as Extra Innings, Hook, Knights of the Round, Mech Warrior. Mega Man X, NFL Football, Paladin's Quest, Phalanx, Shanghai 2 Dragon's Eye, Smart Ball, Super Bomb Man, Super Castlevania 4, Tackle Super Bowl, Tackle Super NBA Basketball, Top Gear 3000, Interesting Tales of Spike and Fang, Ultra Fighter, and Dick Zone. 
This can create some redundancy between the ad and the box and cartridge which often match, and sometimes the in-game title screen actually looks like it too, and then you end up with four of the same image. When this happens, like with Chester Cheetah Wild Wild Quest, it seems odd that the actually unique gameplay screenshots weren't made a little larger, especially when there seems to be room to do so. And then there's Secret of Mana, with an ad and a strategy guide cover showing the full art of the mana tree and three protagonists also seen on the box, cartridge, and title screen, so we're literally seeing the same image five times. Such redundancy. Certainly the ad or strategy guide cover could have been replaced with an additional gameplay screenshot. There are nice pieces of art by Thor Thorvaldsen in the middle of each volume. They each feature a colorful bunch of characters from Super NES games, with each group representing games from half of the alphabet. And there are a few articles at the end of each volume. The first volume has an article titled The Console Wars by Russell DiMario about the rise of Sega with their genesis before Nintendo fought back to reclaim their throne. And then an article by Alex McCumbers defending the value of emulation as a means to preserve gaming history. The second volume looks at three supers, the Super Game Boy, Super Metroid, and the Super Scope Bazooka accessory. Yes, Super Metroid deserves another look. It's that good. So that's the SNES Omnibus by Brent Weiss. But like I alluded to, there are other Super NES books either out now or in the very near future. So what makes this stand out? Let's look at what I like and what I thought could have been done differently. Pros. Unlike all other books of this type that seek to cover an entire console's game library that I've reviewed on this channel, including the ones I expect to review in the near future, the SNES Omnibus features a minimum of one whole page per game, as opposed to only half or a quarter of a page or even less. And these are large pages too. 96 games actually get the honor of having two pages, 27 from the first half of the alphabet and 69 from the second half. This allows for quite a lot of text, much more than just one or two paragraphs. As mentioned, these are more like overviews than reviews, so in reading about a game you may have never played before, in many cases, you may quickly learn the names of all the stages or playable characters because there's just that much detail. If you're looking for a game to play and want to know more about its actual gameplay, more than what the back of a box would tell you, these overviews are perfect for really getting to these specifics. Many of these games hold up pretty well even to this day, and so you might be enticed to try some of these games out if you haven't, which is harder to accomplish if they only had a paragraph or two like in many other books of this type. They also don't shy away from mentioning non-Nintendo platforms, like if a game is ported or re-released or has sequels elsewhere. For example, it's not unusual to read about how a game compares to its Sega Genesis counterpart, including which one is better and why. Everyone already knows that Mortal Kombat on the Genesis retains the blood and violence unlike the Super NES version, though that has better graphics and sound. But you don't expect most people to know that Race Drive-In on the Genesis is superior to the virtually unplayable port on the SNES. Then again, that game is trash on either console, so maybe Brett Weiss deserves points just for suffering through them. In terms of presentation, these books definitely have a very clean, uncluttered layout. What caught my eye when I first saw these books is how professionally put together these are. The straightforward, no-nonsense design is appropriate for this kind of book, which is akin to an encyclopedia. Thor Thorvaldsen's montages of characters in each volume are very well done. I don't like to criticize fan art, but here I honestly have nothing bad to say about these, as they are great. Before I even started reading this, I was almost totally convinced that being split into two volumes would count as a negative. But with over 720 games here now each getting sizable coverage, it might be a little unwieldy if it were to fit almost 900 pages into a single massive tome. So maybe the choice to go with two volumes was right after all. Cons. As mentioned, it is missing International Superstar Soccer and International Superstar Soccer Deluxe. So it's therefore not so omni since it doesn't include everything. And here's a big one, the screenshots. Since video games are very visual, in a book that catalogs almost all the Super NES games, you would expect lots of screenshots to see what they all look like. The problem is, these screenshots, mostly from mobygames.com, are often not well selected. For starters, the screenshots from any one game shouldn't all be similar to each other, and I don't just mean Arrival Turf's two screenshots which are literally the exact same image, which is probably just a mistake. But take a game like Mickey Mania, with each stage from one of several Mickey Mouse animated features throughout history, yet its only two screenshots here are both from Steamboat Willie? What a missed opportunity. Realm manages to have four screenshots, 
but they're all seemingly from the same area, and three of those have exactly the same score and number of lives. World Heroes 2's 2's... World Heroes 2's 2's... World Hero 2's... World Heroes 2's... 2 screens... Okay, we can't do that. World Hero 2's... Why do I say World Hero 2's? It's World Heroes... Rewind. <laughs> World Heroes 2's 2 screenshots... Hey, okay, rewind. No. World Heroes 2's 2 screenshots are from the same match, it seems, as they have the same characters in the same arena. Even when the screenshots aren't of the same area, maybe only seconds apart, there are still questionable choices. For example, the golf game PGA Tour somehow manages to be worthy of having a whopping five gameplay screenshots, and yet Brad Faxon is the only golfer featured, despite there being 10 players. Power Moves 2 screenshots show the Joe character in the exact same frame of animation performing the same fireball move, even though these are separate fights. Pitfall, the mine adventure, makes room for a third screenshot much larger than the other two, but uses it to show the original Atari 2600 game Pitfall, which is included in the game. But considering its resolution and simplicity, it really should have been one of the smaller ones, at least to allow a main gameplay shot to be larger. And if a cartridge is a compilation of games, how hard would it have been to show at least one shot from each included game? Yet Ninja Gaiden Trilogy, despite having two pages, and therefore more room, only shows early shots of the third game. Unless you count the microscopic screenshots on the back of the box, which is included here, but that doesn't seem like a worthwhile addition. And one of Super Mario All-Star's major selling points was the inclusion of The Lost Levels, the original direct sequel to Super Mario Bros., being released for the first time in the West. Yet, for the pages for both this and the re-release that also includes Super Mario World, there are literally no gameplay shots of The Lost Levels. Even when the screenshots are representative and varied, they might still be too tiny to make out what's going on. Without a magnifying glass, would you know what's in these Ogre Battle screenshots? That game deserves better. And since Bubsy, Shaq Fu, and Timon and Puma's Jungle Games are apparently worthy of getting two pages each, you'd think Ogre Battle should be more than deserving of a second page to actually spread out this text and have screenshots that you can actually see. Two points of interest before I leave this rant about screenshots. Back when Bitmap Books was trying to publish the unofficial NES Famicom, a visual compendium, I recall its funding on Kickstarter being frozen mere hours before completion due to a copyright claim by Nintendo. Bitmap Books still managed to release their book in the end, but one of Nintendo's stipulations was to have more text with each screenshot. As of saying, an image-heavy book without much discussion or analysis is somehow problematic. Like a book of just screen captures is bad, but if there's discussion and analysis, then it's fair. So I speculate if similar copyright concerns also applied to the SNES Omnibus, and there had to be a certain ratio of text to images. Though I would think that this would be all the more reason that the few screenshots there are should be more different from each other to really make the best use of the limited opportunity. As noted, many or most of these screenshots are from MobyGames.com. Great resource overall, but not as thorough with the less popular games, so that explains the limited choices of screenshots for games like Realm. It doesn't seem like all screenshots only came from Moby Games, so if it's already not limited to that, once again, I think more should have been done with the screenshot selection process. Other than the content of those images, my next complaint is about their layout. In the first volume, the images are a bit more chaotic. Despite consistently including a box shot, a cartridge shot, and a title screenshot in every overview, only the box shot is consistently in the upper left corner. Why couldn't the other shots remain in the same location on every page? At least in the second volume, which was published later, there's a bit more control, as the box shot will always have the cartridge shot next to it, immediately followed by the title screen. But, and this goes for both volumes, even the box shot is inconsistent in terms of its size. Sometimes it's the same width as the first column of text, but most often it juts out a little bit into the next column and cuts into its text, though more so in the first volume, where in the second volume it just pushes all of the text down and creates more white space. Then the positions and sizes of all other images vary greatly, yet as mentioned in the case of the screenshots, too often are just too small, even despite available space. Okay, enough about images and layout. Now while the writing is very good overall, because it's very professionally written by someone who actually writes for a living, anyone familiar with particular games can find a number of specific game details incorrect. For example, Super Metroid is said to be followed by numerous sequels, but of the eight games listed, 
Six of them are actually prequels. Mortal Kombat is here said to be reimagined in 2011, which isn't an accurate statement. Much like 2009's Star Trek film, it's a reboot within its own continuity, as in the reboot is actually a thing that happens within the story, not from outside of it. So it's really a sequel rewriting its own history, which is not the same thing as a reimagining. Is that getting nitpicky over semantics or technicalities? Is it too much to expect all this to be known? Maybe. But sometimes there are conflicts of actual, factual information between different sources writing about the same game. The description of the Ninja Warriors says, Absent from the home version are shuriken attacks. Yet in the Insider Insight, Michael Thomason writes that the game involves a lot of shurikens. So many, in fact, that it is nearly impossible to keep count of them all. So, which is it? Absent or impossible to count? It doesn't seem like it should be possible to be unsure between zero or near infinite. Sometimes inconsistencies can be found from sequential reviews. For example, Tiny Toon Adventures Buster Bust Loose says it is based on the Tiny Toon Adventures animated series, which ran from 1990 to 1994. Yet Tiny Toon Adventures Wacky Sport Challenge says it aired from 1990 to 1995. Which is it? The overview for Super Mario World says there are four saved games. Despite a few pages earlier for the compilation of Super Mario All-Stars and Super Mario World, it says there are three. On that note, you would think details of a popular game like Super Mario World should be error-free. But besides the number of saves, it is said to have 96 levels, which is also incorrect. The stages have more than one exit, some hidden, for a total of 96 exits, which is what the number on the save file really refers to. For Mortal Kombat 3, when listing characters as Kano, the Black Dragon, and Sub-Zero, the Rogue Lin, as in Lin Kuei, but without the word the, and just using commas, it really sounds like they are saying Black Dragon and Rogue Lin are names of separate characters, which they are not. You probably wouldn't notice if you didn't know the game, but if you did, you'd be scratching your head. These are just some of the errors I found. Not tons more though, and I guess I've given a pass to other books for having some errors considering the amount of text there is overall, and since there is so much written for every game here, I once again won't be too harsh. But one thing that is particularly grievous is the messing up of the name of one of the titles. Are you kidding me? The sequel to Donkey Kong Country is called Diddy's Conquest. Read or listen to that carefully. Diddy's Conquest. As in Conquest. It is a deliberate pun. Not Diddy Kong's Quest like it is written here. Now I know that somehow a lot of people do miss this. Literally a few days before I read this, I saw a post on a Facebook group where someone had just recognized this pun and this was somehow a revelation to so many others in the group all over 30s gamers like myself. Considering this error was repeated in the Insider Insight, either they both made the same mistake, or Brett Weiss and or the editor overcorrected something that wasn't actually wrong. Now, I know it's silly, but it shouldn't be too much to ask that the best Donkey Kong Country game should have its title written out properly, should it? You can now expect me to watch for this potential error in all future Super NES books I review. And lastly, why is Final Fantasy III not deserving of two pages? Really? Everyone's free to have an opinion, but if 96 games get the honor of twice the coverage, a list that somehow includes Boogerman and Shaq Fu, then it surely got robbed. So anyway, in conclusion, I sure had a lot to gripe about when it came to the finer details, but I guess some errors, mostly minor, are almost expected considering all of the written text here which I should appreciate, as it has far more detail than other books of this type usually have. Two games being missing is bad in principle, but, and this is not a knock in soccer, or football if you prefer, I'm not sure how much more enriched I would be in reading about International Superstar Soccer and International Superstar Soccer Deluxe. Just being honest. However, it is harder to forgive the way too tiny and not really representative screenshots. I know you'd be buying this more for the text, and not for the printed out screenshots from mobygames.com, these visuals definitely could have been more varied. Now because there are a few other Super NES books I plan to review, I'm not yet sure if I can fairly recommend this one over the ones that haven't come out yet at the time of shooting this video, if you feel you can only get one. But from what I've seen, I can confidently say that if you want lots, and I do mean lots, to read about each of the Super NES games seen here, and you really want to get deep into what these games are all about, 
Red Vice will probably have you more than covered in the SNES Omnibus. So overall, my nitpicking aside, this is still solid. So the SNES Omnibus gets a 4 out of 5. Hey, if you like this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. That really helps keep me going with producing this video content. Like I said, I have a number of books I still plan to review, so you want to subscribe to know when I get these videos done. So keep enjoying your games and your books about games. And if you haven't seen my other video series, check out my games about games. Until then, or the next book review, see ya.